and Hannah asked me to, to chair this session, I'm delighted to do so. Um, we've got three speakers in this session, and even though the third speaker is not the speaker who was in the program, who's delayed and can't unfortunately be here, but it will be, he will be replaced by a um, rather unknown scholar called Anne Curry, who will <laughs> give a paper and, and we'll hear more about her paper a bit later on. But uh, to start off on this session on the cost and impact of all we've got, um, Ian McInnes from the Centre for History at the University of the Islands and Islands. And Ian is, um, has completed his PhD in Aberdeen in 2008 after studying in Glasgow as well as research focuses on um, various aspects of the Scottish Wars of Independence, the Second Scottish War and the First One, and particularly interested in, in conduct and behaviour of Scottish and English troops. His publications include articles on um, the burial of Scots, on Barber's description of the Scots arm, Scottish arms and armour, on injuries and death in the Anglo-Scottish combat and various other parts. <coughs> and his, following, his forthcoming monograph is looking also at the Second Scottish War of Independence. So now over to Ian with the title of The Return of the Scots, the Impact of Scottish, um, of Scottish Raiding of the Northern England in the 1940s. Thank you. Uh, the impact and legacy of Scottish raiding uh, of Northern England during the first Scottish Wars of Independence has been the subject of significant study. English record evidence in particular provides detailed accounts of the extent of the raids of Robert Bruce and his commanders, the amount of money and goods taken, and the impact that such raids had on the economy and society of the region. Considerably less analysis has focused, however, on the raids undertaken by Scottish commanders during the next phase of conflict, in particular in the later 1330s and 1340s. In part, this is because the Neville's Cross campaign in 1346, which acts as the end point for this phase of raiding, uh, casts a long shadow backwards uh, and negatively affects the perception of uh, Scottish warfare in this period. Moreover, the relatively short duration of this reading phase has ensured that it remains a less appreciated element in discuss discussions of Anglo-Scottish conflict. I would argue, however, that these raids deserve closer examination in order to better understand the nature, extent and impact of these attacks on the English countryside during a period when English focus was increasingly drawn towards France. In particular, this paper will consider the depiction of these raids in English sources and the picture that the available evidence <coughs> presents uh, of these incursions. For it does appear that the English North returned to something like the dark days of the 1310s, that local lords often could not be depended upon to defend the region from Scottish depredations, and that this was a period when the English Crown largely abandoned the English North to its fate and Northern Englishmen to deal with the Scots as best they could. The most obvious effects of war in Northern England then relates to the physical damage caused and the ensuing economic impact of such destruction. Scottish raiding of Northern England largely exhibited similar destructive traits to Bruce raids in Scotland around the same time. English chroniclers consistently describe the actions of the Scots in terms which focus upon destruction, with of course the element of plunder never far away. Although chronicle sources are invariably hostile to the Scots and their activities, the language involved in describing the raids differs little from similar English accounts uh, of raiding in France. Lacking only its triumphalism associated with the English campaigns on the continent, chronicle accounts of Scottish raiding remain likely to contain more than an element of truth in their descriptions. So, the Scottish raids of 1333, for example, launched in response to the siege of Berwick, involved slaying and burning and carrying off prey and booty. In a small-scale attack in 1337, Scottish raiders marched east from Arthurit in Cumberland, burning 20 villages, seizing a large number of cattle and also several prisoners for ransom. And all of this was accomplished in a single day. In October 1337, a raid of much grander scale than those launched previously made its way through Cumberland. Having done considerable damage around Carlisle, the Scots burned much of Allerdale and sent a detachment of men south to Copeland to seize cattle. Following the death of Andrew Murray, uh, who had strongly uh, advocated the raiding of Northern England, new leaders such as Alexander Ramsay continued these attacks. Ramsay repeatedly went to England, seized plunder, led away captives, and wasted provinces with fire and sword. A raid on Cumberland in the summer of 1346 brought slaughter and fire to that area, the Scots returning across the border with great droves of cattle. These literary descriptions of Scottish raiding are supported by administrative evidence produced for the English Crown. A letter to Edward III described the 1340 raid on Northumberland. On this occasion, the Scots captured a good 2,000 fat beasts and many prisoners. Following the Neville's Cross campaign, 
Inquisitions were set up to investigate claims made by the people of Cumberland and Northumberland that they had acquired relief from taxation because of damage to their land. The Inquisitions found that the Scots have frequently entered the said parts and have burned and destroyed the lands, depriving the men of the county of their goods and chattels. Other examples include Robert Clifford's manor at Ellingham in Northumberland. An Inquisition of 1339 found that his manor house lay in a ruined state, that the mill had been burned by the Scots, and only a third of demean lands had been sown for the forthcoming year, the rest lying waste and uncultivated for lack of tenants who had apparently fled as a result of the Scottish incursions. Ellingham was already in decline before Scottish raiding began once more in the later 1330s. Um, the depressed state, however, was only exacerbated by these Scottish raids, and the manor only showed signs of recovery by the 15th century. Other administrative accounts uh, detail damage and destruction suffered by the states of monastic houses throughout the English North. So in Northumberland, Newminster Abbey received respite from the English crown because the Scots had burned 13 of the, abbey, of the abbey's manors, destroyed its grain and wasted its lands. Holystone Priory was granted 10 quarters of wheat by the king because the Scots had burned their granges, and Brinkburg Priory was granted 20 quarters of wheat by Edward III as its granges, lands, goods and chattels in Northumberland have been destroyed in the last invasion of the Scots in July 1333, so that the monk's state is much depressed. In this case, the geographical scale of the destruction was possible because of the size of the Bruce Scottish invasion force involved prior to the Battle of Halladon Hill. Other raids were of a much smaller scale, but the destruction produced by even these could be considerable. So, for example, the Northumbrian lands of Nicholas Menel uh, were raided before November 1341. An inquisition recorded that at Hefpool uh, he held three cottages, six shillings of rents, and six acres of meadow from the king, which in peacetime were worth six shillings, sixpence a year, but now nothing, as Hefpool has been for the most part devastated by the Scots. Menel had le- held lands elsewhere in Northumberland, at Wooler, Belford, Lowick, and Cheviot. Uh, the lack of damage to these lands suggests, however, that the damage at Hefpool was at the hands of a small-scale inversion invasion uh, which had literally nipped over the border uh, and not proceeded much further uh, at this time. Further evidence of devastation in the same county appears in the accounts of the Knights Hospitaller for 1338. The manor of Chiburn was described as ruined, rents were reduced because the manor lay on the Scottish march, and the total return from the manor was much reduced because the land is destroyed and much depreciated by the war with the Scots. At Thornton in Northumberland, just east of Norham, uh, and only a few miles from the border, the impact of the war is presented again in stark detail. Of 300 acres of arable land, normally worth six pence an acre and returning seven pound ten shillings in peacetime, the value had halved to only three pence an acre by 1338. Rents worth 30 pounds when the Templars held the land previously returned only 12 pounds because of the war with the Scots. The fall in the value of the land likely relates to wartime damage as crops were burned uh, or indeed trampled by troops and horses. The fallen rents suggest the tenants had fled their holdings altogether, presumably in search of safer lands out of reach of Scottish raiders, a longer-term impact from which it was more difficult, perhaps, to recover. Financial losses as a result of Scottish raiding led, of course, to pleas from both secular and religious communities for reassessment of or remittance from taxation. Indeed, such claims became commonplace throughout this period. Such pleas must, of course, be used carefully when analysing the extent of destruction. Once reassessment or remittance of taxation had been secured, communities often worked incredibly hard to ensure that this state of affairs persisted, whether that relief remained appropriate or not. As a brief example, the Abbey of Revo received a grant of £10 of Mortmain uh, land and rent because of losses sustained through Scottish raiding in the 1320s. The Abbey continued, however, to receive rents from these lands until the reign of Richard II, even though its estates are not known to have been affected by any Scottish raids after 1327. Instead, therefore, of looking purely at claims of poverty from English communities, alternative financial evidence is provided by the accounts of ransom payments given to the Scots to purchase safety from future damage. For the Scots did not raid Northern England only to cause destruction and deprive the local people of their goods. Greater profit could be acquired through demands for protection money in return from immunity from destruction and from plunder. The efficient blackmailing of the English North had, of course, provided Robert I with large quantities of money. Similar rewards were sought by David II and his commanders, and, as before, English communities readily agreed to pay. 
The people of Carlisle, for example, purchased a truce for 300 marks in 1346 as a result of the Scottish army's appearance a few miles east at Liddle. A similar truce was agreed for Westmoreland. To avoid Scottish attacks, the people of Westmoreland uh, paid the sum of £233.6 six shillings eightpence to secure the safety of their lands. This sum paid to the Scots uh, was greater than the county's yearly contribution to the 10th and 15th granted previously to the Crown, which raised £180 in each of the two years of the tax. Similarly, in 1346, David II reportedly wrote to the Bishop of Durham to demand 1,000 marks or enough bread to supply his army for the duration of his campaign, in return for not destroying the lands of the Palatinate. Separate agreements were also reportedly negotiated with Durham's secular landowners and with the monks of Durham. The former agreed to pay, pay specifically to ensure the lands and manors were spared destruction, and the latter promised to pay an indemnity to the Scots for themselves and their estates and tenants that the Scots should stay no longer. Where the source material provides detail of how much the Scots were able to extract from Northern English communities, it does appear that the amounts were comparable to those raised during the systematic attacks of Robert I during the 1310s and 1320s. The £200 raised from Carlisle and the surrounding district in 1346 is uh, relative to the £400 agreed for the entire county of Cumberland in December 1314. The combined sum of £422.6 shillings eightpence from Carlisle and, uh, and Westmoreland compares favourably to the sum of £400 demanded from both counties uh, in January 1319. Similarly, the 1,000 marks demanded from the Bishop of Durham, along with the separate agreements made with the Durham monks and the local uh, landholders, compares favourably with the 800 marks extracted from the bishopric in 1314 and 1317 and the 1,000 marks paid in 1327. Although these blackmail payments uh, from the 1340s pale somewhat in comparison to the sum of 2,200 marks demanded of Cumberland in 1313-14, uh, although Robert I received only around 1,290 marks of this sum from the county, this example is indicative of the sums demanded by a confident Scottish monarch when the Scots held a dominant military position. Uh, I would argue the Scots were once again mil militarily ascendant in the 1340s, <coughs> and thus were able to extract some considerable financial gain from northern English communities. That this was not as financially rewarding in the long term as a result of the more piecemeal nature of similar demands in the 1330s and 40s. Interrupted by truces and then ended by the Scottish defeat at Neville's Cross, the raiding of this period could not replicate the ceaseless recurrence of demands for money exhibited in the 1310s. But the ease and rapidity with which northern English communities paid up suggest that they at least feared that it could. The consequences of the damage and loss described already were reflected somewhat in Northern English society and politics. It was during the Anglo-Scottish Wars the relations between the people of the two kingdoms became, perhaps unsurprisingly, increasingly hostile, and negative perceptions of the other began to develop. In November 1336, for example, protection was granted to Andrew Le Boyer of York, citizen of that city, who had resided there for 28 years and lived there still with his wife and his children. He feared that having been born in Scotland, he may be injured by those that are jealous of him. Cynthia Neville has argued that people such as Boyer were forced to ensure themselves against claims of treacherous behaviour based upon little evidence other than questionable claims over their place of birth and perceived Scottishness. The level of fear demonstrated towards Scots living amongst the English population is perhaps overstated, but there is evidence of a concern at times of a Scottish fifth column. Invasion fears, for example, exacerbated bouts of anti-Scottish sentiment, and in late 1345, these prompted Edward III to order the expulsion of any Scots found living north of the Trent. English fears were at their greatest with regard to Scots residing in occupied towns. Berwick troubled the English administration most. It was feared, for example, that the town's Scottish population would collude with the enemy to allow its capture. As a consequence, in February 1335, John Swain of Berwick, John Moyne and Thomas Dorchester were sent to Newcastle having been arrested in the town on suspicion of association with the Scots. Two months later, the new custodian of the town was granted powers to banish all suspicious persons whether they were English or Scots. And these powers were utilised before October 1335 when 20 men were released having previously been arrested as suspicious persons. English viewers were of course not without foundation. At English held Roxburgh, there may have been an attempt to overthrow the town's administration involving members of the castle's own garrison. In February 1339, Edward III ordered the arrest of certain men whom he was informed had been involved in a plot to capture the castle for the Bruce Scots. In 
Amongst those arrested were Hugh and Thomas Sampson, both men-at-arms who'd been part of William Felton's castle garrison there in 1336. Fears of collusion were only increased whenever the Thud's attentions were, focus, attentions were focused increasingly on France, and northern English nobles were left in charge of their own border defence. Indeed, there were even fears of conspiracy between northern English nobles and the Scots themselves. In response to at least three Scottish raids during September and October 1337, the Lanarkos chronicler suggested that an unnamed noble had in fact assisted the Scots. He wrote that it had been commonly but secretly reported for a long time that a certain noble in the North Country was unduly favourable to the Scottish side, and that he did, on that occasion, as on other occasions, inform them beforehand at what time they might safely invade England with their army, and afterwards sent them word when they should leave it. Henry Knighton expressed similar views when describing the Scottish raids of 1346. He stated that the raids earlier in the year were to the great scandal of the Northern Magnets, who were believed by many to have been the Scots' accomplices in those evils and to have consented to them. Fears over the loyalty of the northern nobility may also have affected Edward III himself. As late as 1358 to 63, many northern estates estreated to the crown based on claims of past disloyalty and cooperation with the Scots by members of the northern nobility and gentry. It has been argued that through these estates and the redistribution of the same northern territories, Edward III sought to place loyal crown servants in strategically important areas, create greater stability in northern England. Uh, while he campaigned on the continent and ensured the loyalty of his northern nobles. For those men who were able to regain their forfeited estates, the streets were a blunt reminder that the king was able and indeed willing to punish them if they did not fulfil their defensive duties. The resumption of Scottish raiding from 1333 played on northern English fears of a return to the dark days of the 1310s and 1320s. One response to the renewed attacks was the payment of protection money, as already discussed. Another was to move goods and possessions far from the border uh, and to further safety uh, further south. In late 1355, for example, when the Scots captured Berwick Town and laid siege to the castle, Adam Prendergast took the precaution of moving his wool and hides from Prendergast in Berwickshire to Haggerston in Northumberland for their safety. At times, the English Crown ordered the entire population of Northern England to take similar action and move livestock to safer locations. The aristocracy in particular were at pains to ensure the safety of their horses and possessed the wherewithal to remove them to a safer location should the Scots threaten an attack. In light of the renewed warfare of 1332-3, and likely in response to the Bruce Scottish raiding of the latter year, Ralph Neville sent his horses south from sites at Inglewood and Raby in Cumberland and Ulgham in Northumberland to Coverdale in the North Riding and Evanwood in Durham because of the Scots. Even the king's own royal stud uh, in northern England was moved south in 1336-7 from Inglewood Forest in Cumberland to a safer location further south at Nailsborough in the North Riding. This was also done for fear of the Scots. The impact of war on the political situation in northern England was much less pronounced perhaps than it was in Scotland, but the region provided an, an ongoing problem for Edward III. Unrest in the north was an issue that had spilled over from the reign of, course, of Edward II, uh, but the new king faced difficulties in organising Northern England's defence as a result. He was, for example, forced to negotiate with his magnates at various times to ensure their continued commitment to border defence. Moreover, the arraying of forces in the north at times stirred up local antagonism. This is evident from as early as 1333, when the English king summoned an army to repel the Scots. Instructions were sent subsequently to the commissioners of array in these riding to arrest any in rebellion there who refused to obey the king's order to muster. Similar orders were issued to the commissioners of Cumberland and Westmoreland, stating that anyone resisting their authority was to be imprisoned. Indeed, the resumption of both Scottish raids uh, in Cumberland in 1337, sorry, of Scottish raids in Cumberland in 1337, may have led to an additional decline in the number of local men willing to join the king's armies, choosing instead to remain at home to defend their lands and possessions themselves. This prompted Edward III to send out orders to arrest those who failed to perform military service or indeed who had deserted. Although such problems affected army summonses throughout England, the reaction of Northern England was particularly dangerous. If Edward III was to divert an increasing amount of time, money and manpower to the continent, then the burden of expectation fell upon the Northern Northerners to provide for their own defence. If they were unwilling or indeed unable to act, then the English king faced difficulties that the Scots were likely to and indeed did exploit. <coughs> 
Goodwin has argued that the English defence against Scottish raids was best performed by a series of fortified residences belonging to the northern barons. Alongside the royal castles of northern England, they provided bases for local troops who could respond quickly to Scottish action, supported in turn by the men of neighbouring garrisons. If this was indeed Edward III's plan, it was not, however, always successful. Alexander Ramsay's raid into Northumberland during the siege of Dunbar in 1338 was met by the combined forces of Robert Manners and William Heron, probably accompanied by men from their respective garrisons at Ettel and Ford. There appears, however, to have been no assistance from Thomas Grey at nearby Norham, and the English forces were defeated. Grey himself suffered defeat in 1355 when faced by a Scottish raiding force at Nisbet, where he appears to have fought the Scots devoid of any support from his neighbours. An inability to mount defence in depth is also questioned by the Scottish invasion of Cumberland in October 1337. On this occasion, the Scots were met by Anthony Lucy and men from the West March. Henry Percy and Ralph Neville also gathered troops from Northumberland to assist in countering the Scottish incursion, but they arrived too late, after the Scots had already retreated, to successfully defend Cumberland. In contrast to the successful muster of Northern England, uh, Northern England's resources in response to the Neville's cross invasion, these examples demonstrate that the defence of the English North was far from foolproof. Popular unrest was also visible in Northern England and manifested itself in various ways. There was upheaval within key northern English towns that, although not necessarily caused by wartime events, occurred at a very dangerous time as Scottish incursions of England became more frequent. There were riots in Newcastle in 1341 over the election of the town's mayor, and disturbances broke out in the town once more in 1345, both years, of course, of Scottish invasion. In the same year, Carlisle, which Somerson describes in the 1340s as existing in a state of complete demoralisation, Witness riots as well as fighting between the garrison and the townsmen. This general state of disorder was only resolved by the spring of 1346, just in time for another Scottish invasion. During this period of instability, the Scots actively raided Cumberland on more than one occasion, and these disturbances affected the ability of the West March to defend itself. There were also problems, of course, at English held Berwick. In 1341, the keepers of the town gates were accused of extorting money from merchants who passed into the town and of helping themselves to some of their produce. Edward III wrote to the local administration around the same time and ordered the constable of Berwick and his ministers to desist from seizing the goods and property of merchants and burgesses. Instead, they should conduct themselves honourably. In November 1342, orders were further dispatched that the burgesses and merchants of Berwick should no longer be retained in the defence of the town. The response of the local administration only succeeded, however, in provoking further unrest. Felons were apparently pardoned and employed to provide adequate defence. This further upset Berwick's burgesses and merchants, some of whom may have been robbed by the very men now serving to protect them. The burgesses then, were, in turn, were rebuked by Edward III and ordered not to interfere with the work of the king's ministers in the town. So all was not happy in Berwick. Uh, unrest then at Berwick, like that at Carlisle, was a direct threat to the safety of Northern England and failure to deal with it successfully only led to further concerns over the stability of the English frontier region. Unrest in Northern England was also exhibited in the apparently lawless nature of the border counties. Although, of course, a problem for many years, renewed war conditions from 1332 created opportunities for men to flout the law and indeed to escape punishment. And although not purely a border problem, the wartime situation again made such behaviour particularly dangerous for the English crown and the war effort. A favourite tactic employed by northern criminals was kidnapping. In 1332, it was reported that Roger Kirkpatrick, a Scot who had fled Scotland for his own safety, was abducted not long after arriving in England. The king ordered an inquisition to look into the matter, as Kirkpatrick had been uh, captured whilst under a royal safe conduct. In 1340, Edward III appointed Gilbert Umfreville, Henry Percy and Ralph Neville to, quote, put down the evildoers who infest the passes and woods in Northumberland and make prisoners of and rob and slay his lieges, both Scots and English. A similar commission was given to Thomas Wake of Liddell, Anthony Lucy and Peter Tilliel in Cumberland and Westmoreland. In August 1341, Robert Parving, Thomas Fencoats, Peter Tilliel and Clement Skelton were ordered to deliver various Cumberland men to Carlisle Jail, who were accused of kidnapping men from the county and taking them to Scotland, where they extorted ransoms from their prisoners. And in, in October 1341, the Bishop of Durham and the Sheriffs of York and Northumberland were ordered to seek out malefactors who had formed gangs to capture and ransom local people, hunt them down and see that they were brought to justice. Duties such as these were far from straightforward, however, and Thomas Lucy, uh, warden of the West March, informed the king in October 1351 that he himself had been seized while carrying out similar orders in Gilsland. Uh, 
He had been imprisoned while his servants had been assaulted. If the king's officers were not safe in their own localities, there was little chance that lesser men could avoid the dangers posed by thieves and kidnappers. Again, although such behaviour was not perhaps a direct consequence of the war as such, criminality in the north did flourish in wartime conditions. So, the Crown's inability to control lawlessness, as an example, coupled with the renewed Scottish raiding, led led to ever-growing unrest in Northern England. For the Crown, this state of affairs endangered the stability of the area of the Kingdom that served as its front line in the war with Scotland. For the Northerners themselves, it appeared that the Crown was more interested in events on the continent, and that Northern England was increasingly being abandoned to a state last seen during the reign of Edward II. For it was the combination of these various impacts that ensured that Scottish raiding, though of relatively short duration, was nonetheless keenly felt. It produced, moreover, an important psychological impact, for the return of Scottish raiding appeared to have been greeted with a sense of resignation by the people of Northern England. Fear of Scottish attack spread in part by the English Crown itself, as it sought to ensure an almost permanent Northern English military presence on the marches, gave rise to yet further concerns. Suspicions of a Scottish fifth column in England developed alongside fears over the ability and the desire of the English nobility um, to to protect the North uh, from these continued Scottish raids. Um, An acceptance that Scottish raiding was again to become a regular part of life is evident in examples such as the movement of goods and livestock out of range of raiding soldiers, as well as the ease with which some areas adopted once more a system of paying off the Scots. A feeling of the instability of the region is perhaps best represented in the political problems faced by the English Crown in dealing with its own subjects. Increasing agitation in the northern counties as local men fought their own war against the evading Scots while Edward III fought in France was demonstrated in local upheaval and a determined attempt uh, to avoid paying many of the forms of taxation uh, expected by the English Crown. The fears of those most affected by the conflict were only likely to grow as an immediate resolution to the conflict appeared more remote. And as Thomas Gray wrote in the 1350s, King Edward was so distressed with his affairs beyond the sea that he took little regard to the Scottish matters. That Northern England was effectively saved by the Scottish defeat at Neville's Cross should not detract from the grim reality that several years of Scottish raiding brought once more to Northern England. Thank you.